candidates. Please welcome Mr. Mplogo. I'm back here with you today on a paper one revision session. So this revision session is aiming at uh, equipping you on how to answer typical questions from previous question papers. So it acts as a guideline to guide you on how you can approach the question paper. So remember, it's paper one. We are doing both macroeconomics and economic pursuits. This slide simply indicates or shows or gives you a summary on how your SBA mark has been calculated in your own school. So it is written 2022 SBA mark calculation. You will remember that in term one, you did the project out of 50 marks. It was marked and you were given the feedback. You know that. You know the mark you achieved. Still in term one, you were given a test out of 100 marks. It was marked and you know the outcome of that as an individual. In term two, there was a task, task number three. Assignment, it was out of uh, 50 marks and it was marked, you got the outcome. In this uh, calculation, you don't include your paper one and paper two for June examination. Task number four, the case study. That was in term three. The, the case study you wrote out of 50 marks. And then you said for your preparator examination paper one. You will remember that paper. And then you said for preparator examination paper two out of 150, 150. And then all in all, you have worked out of 550 marks. So now that simply means this is converted to 25%, which is your year mark. So your year mark is 25%. Meaning your upcoming examination is out of 300, paper 1, 150, paper 2, 150, converted to 75%. This is the 75%. So after that conversion, what happens? Your SBA mark out of 25 will be added to your exam mark out of 75%. Then that will give you your 100% marks. Just want to give you the highlight on what uh, has been happening since then. So now be aware you have this 25% in your pocket or less than 25%. We are all working for 75%, meaning this 300 marks will be converted to 75%. So you need to ensure that you achieve according to your target. You need to push and do more because working out of 75, you still have a lot to work for here. You can't simply depend on 25%. Remember that there's also mark variance. If your exam mark maybe is more than your SPA for the year, with beyond maybe 10%, there might be a problem. Your SPA might be reduced. So you need to do as if this is the first assessment we are doing in grade 12 this year. You need to push yourself so that you put yourself under the good advantage for this year. This slide is all about topics uh, distribution across paper one content. We have question one, which is our section A. So it combines both the macroeconomics topics and economic pursuits topics. You have your question two. Your question two consists of the circular flow, topic number one, which is the macroeconomics, business cycles, public sector, and the foreign exchange markets. These are the topics that we need to master if you want to answer question two. And then question number three, we have economic pursuits questions. I mean topics in there, we have the production and free trade, we have economic growth and development, regional development and indicators which include economic and social indicators. If you want to do or to answer on question three, these are the topics that we need to master for next week Tuesday. Question number four. Question four combines both macroeconomics and economic pursuits. That simply means if you want to answer question four in your examination, you need to know both economic, uh, I mean macroeconomics topics as well as economic pursuits topics because it's a combination. Uh, there is 20 marks for macro, 20 marks for economic pursuits. And then we continue with the topic distribution on essays or section C. You have your question five. Here you have your macroeconomics essay. Out of all of these essays listed, listed here, there will be only one essay to appear. 
you have markets remember markets are there uh, in your circular flow we have economic paradigm or smoothing the business cycle and then you have features underpinning forecasting both of these are under the business cycles you have public sector objectives that is under public sector as a topic you have reasons for public sector failure that's a public sector as a topic also and then we have reasons for foreign or international trade so remember these ones are differentiated into uh, demand reasons and supply reasons so if you want to answer question five in the examination you just have to be a master of these essays one of them will come into the examination and show that you can be able to answer to, to answer in these essays practice on each essay expanding your opportunities to be able to get marks in your essay section c and if you want to answer question six these are the topics that you should consider we have export promotion as an essay and then we have argument in favor of protectionism it's also an essay that are within the same topic and then we have demand side approach to economic growth and development under economic growth and development we have economic growth and development policies and then we have south african end overs to regional development we have economic indicators we have social indicators so you have a choice remember in section c you choose like you do in section b between question five and question six you need to answer one question so you need to know where your strength is when you when you are preparing for examination and study and show that to exhaust those essays some people are very good they can simply uh, do all of these essays for macro and do all of this for economic pursuits and then they have huge advantage over the question paper in that case but we know that some of you are struggling so in that case you need to exhaust one topic if you exhaust macroeconomics to i mean essays exhaust them all so that we expand opportunities for you to simply pick up the the topic the, i mean the essay that will be there and answer it having to know all macroeconomics essays will give you advantage over question five having to know all economic pursuit questions i mean essays will give you an advantage over question six knowing them all then you will cruise in the question paper because even those parts of section c can come as a part of section b because not all of these topics will be questioned but there will be one from macro and one from pursuits so remember within section a b and c percentage contributed by each section i want to highlight something here that is very important that you normally ignore i've been talking about it uh, section a consists of 30 marks these 30 marks contribute 20 percent in the question paper out of 100 percent section b is out of 80 marks this is when you have you are given three questions question two three and four you answer only two questions this contribute about 53.3 percent in your examination and then we have section c which is out of 40 marks remember you're given two questions question five and question six and then it contributes about 26.7% in your examination. So all in all, this gives you 100%. So it is very important for you to take all of these sections as soon as you can. Do not uh, undermine section A, like I've been saying. Ensure that to grab these marks. This is, this is too much contribution. And then also, educate yourself. Be a master on answering in section B. Most of you are not getting it correct in data response and eight marks questions some of you be, i mean think copying the extract will give marks no it doesn't give marks ensure that you develop the skill that I, i've been sharing some tactics on how to answer in section b especially in data response ensure that you develop you improve in there so that come tuesday you go there and grab marks and then section c also uh, ensure that in section c you know or you have an idea of more than 40% for each essay in your economics. Let's say an essay from macroeconomics come in, but you did not exhaust it. But have an idea, know what to do in there. Do not write an essay that have not been questioned. That has been an issue. Do not answer a question that have not been questioned in the examination. Because you won't get marks. And show that to answer the topic. The simple thing, the definition of the concept. It is very important to give you two marks for introduction. As much as you are not sure or you are not having enough information, 
providing subheadings will simply allow you to get some marks, maximum of eight because it's a lower order. Listing those subheadings will simply give you credit. Getting eight marks in there will simply boost you going forward. And then that subheading, have a description where you explain that subheading. Ensure that it's worth two marks, even more with the example provided. So I just, I'm just emphasizing that you cannot get zero in section C. Ensure that about all of these essays that are in the examination guideline, you, you have an idea of each essay. As much as you, you will be exhausting some, not exhausting some, but have an idea of each essay so that you will be able to grab marks in there. Additional part, it's open. You need to think, understand the question, understand the content, and then answer the question. So it becomes easier because it's not mainly dependent on the content, but you must know or have an idea of the content before you to answer the question. And then conclusion, that's when you become critical and, and wrap off your essay. So section A contribute 20%, section B contribute 53,3%, section C contribute 26,7%. All of these percentages are important for you. Ensure that you push yourself so that it will be easy for you to get marks in there. So approaching the question paper, what is it that, should, that you should do to approach the question paper easily? Read each question with understanding before attempting to answer. It is very important that before answering the question, you understand the question statement. You understand the question. Because if you don't understand, what are you answering? What are you saying? What are you responding to? Because whatever you respond to, it means you understood the question, then you are giving the, the response. So ensure that you understand the question before attempting to answer. And then also avoid early excitement when reading the question statement uh, because you might provide irrelevant information. As you read the question, interpret the question, understand it. If ever the question appear to be very much easy for you, ensure that you, you read again with understanding before you answer because that might lead to you forfeiting marks due to the fact that you might end up providing irrelevant information. I'll make an example of one of the previous years where the question paper was a uh, question five. In question five, it was saying the question was saying, discuss all features underpinning focusing, excluding indicators. Then the majority started with indicators because this thing of all features underpinning focusing. Then you stop reading from from there. You answer the question only to find that the, the first thing that you, you responded on was not required in the examination. So it is very important for you to read the question with understanding. Avoid being happy or excited with the first reading of the question. Understand it first before answering. Do not guess section, in section A. And then uh, understand each question statement and relate to the given option. Do not guess. If you are guessing in there, you will lose marks. Those marks are very important. Understand or link or connect those, I mean, uh, those, those statements. Let's assume that the statement is Maybe is a person. There is a person. And then we are given four options. Within these four options, we have A, B, C, and D. So let's assume maybe A, uh, it can be an animal, any kind of an animal. Maybe it can be a cat. And then B, it's a tree. C, it's a grass and D, you have a person. This simply means you have to draw the line and link the person to person, then it makes sense. Here in section A 1.1, we are only, you are mainly linking that given option to the given question statement. It is very important that you do that correctly to get that 16 marks. Also in 1.2, you do the same. We are linking, if there is a person in 1.2.1, there must be also a person somewhere that should be linked to this person. So avoid linking things that are not relating. Relate things accordingly for you to get those marks. And then as we continue, read data response with understanding while highlighting important information. Contextualize it. As you read the data response, ensure that you understand and highlight those important points that are given in the data response because that might assist you as you start to answer questions. Ensure that you contextualize it. Be able to know that uh, this data response belongs to which topic within uh, macroeconomics or which topic within economic pursuit. That will make it easier for you to respond on questions. Improve your ability to link because the question paper requires the most of linking. 
Uh, if I can give you a simple example, most of our questions in the need you to link. Check question two. 2.1.2, you must link in there. You need to link those given concepts. There is one action verb and two concepts that should be related. And then you have 2.2.4. Uh, I mean, yeah, 0.4. You link in there. 2.2.5, you also link. So if you can improve the ability of linking, it will be easy for you in here to, to get questions correct, to get your answers correct. If you can develop the skill of linking, because our question paper desire the most of linking in there. So improve in that, in that aspect so that it will be easy for you uh, to grab those marks. Be smart when answering uh, application questions. Remember, application questions, uh, we can make an example of uh, 2.5, 3.5, as well as 4.5. Those questions are, are mostly uh, desiring you to apply. Uh, also additional parts. So you need to be smart. Avoid clamping two points into one point. Separate points, write them into, into full sentences. If ever you're evaluating, ensure that your evaluation bring you, I mean, provides negative effect and the positive effect that can allow you to grab more marks, but write in full sentences. And always start with answers that you are sure they are correct. That will boost you as you go forward with the responding in the question paper. Answer in full sentences on questions that require explanation. Do not list if you have to explain. Simply explain so that you get credit you deserve. If you list, you won't get enough marks in there. You might know the answer, but if you list, you won't be credited fully. You need to ensure that as you answer the question, you explain where explanation is necessary or required according to mark allocation. And then we continue. Let mark allocation determine time you, you can spend on each sub-question. Sub ensure that you look at mark allocation per, per sub-question. You can't be spending two minutes, I mean, let's say five minutes on responding on one mark question. You can't be writing the full paragraph for one mark. You can't be writing the full paragraph for two marks. Ensure that as you answer, you look at mark allocation, then you provide answers based on marks. And then avoid leaving spaces in section A. Ensure that you answer everything in section A. Avoid answering all three questions in section B. Remember, you have a choice in there. You need to answer only two questions out of three. That simply means that uh, you need to answer those two questions that you believe you, can, you will get more marks on them. And then you leave another one. So answer only to avoid answering all questions because that will lead to you not being able to complete the, the whole question paper due to the fact that you will be spending time on answering the third question which is unnecessary for you. Avoid answering both questions in section C. It is very important, even if you know both of them, ensure that you answer only one because we are given a choice in there. You don't have to answer both. You answer only one as per instruction. Be able to analyze and interpret graphs, cartoons, extracts, and data in section B, data response. It is very important for you to develop your skills of analyzing the data response questions. Analyze data response with understanding and then attempt to answer questions. Uh, also be aware that uh, with the given data response, maximum of two answers might be found in the data response. The rest is from you and your knowledge of the subject. We continue. Do not write an essay that has not been asked in the examination. I spoke about this. We have seen this happening this year. You, you, you are having the skill of answering the question that have not been questioned. Don't answer the question that have not been, I mean, I mean the essay that have not been asked. You find the question paper looking for something, you provide something else that you, you prepared for. No, you cannot ex examine yourself. Answer the questions that are being questioned in the uh, examination question paper because answering the wrong question will mean you get zero. Be able to list subheadings for each essay. It is very important. I've spoken about this. Ensure that you can list subheadings for each essay in the examination. I mean, in the exam guideline and also provide some descriptions. That can lead to you being able to grab marks in the in section C. What you have noted also, uh, as I'm saying, do not write an essay that has not been asked. I want to warn you, avoid these WhatsApp groups as well as Facebook, Facebook group that are selling you scope. There is no scope for examination. We don't have a scope. So avoid going through those groups and seeking for the scope. You will be getting wrong information. You even pay, pay for that. It is wrong because it will mislead you. You will stop studying the complete, uh, the complete topic that should be done. You will focus on those topics that were given by those people in there for which they are wrong. They don't have a scope. So avoid, avoid. It's a warning because you will end up failing due to the fact that you, fo you, you follow some, some leads that are wrong. Even your educator that does not have a, a scope. 
who will have a scope if your teacher does not have a scope? Avoid going around in groups, in Facebook or social media, seeking for scopes. Some of you even sell question papers that are, I mean, that are not even relevant. So avoid doing that. We have seen that during the year, where the, the question paper comes in, and then section C, maybe the question paper needs public sector objectives. You mainly answer reasons for public sector. But like you even provide your own additional party. Where did you get that? It's wrong. You can't be answering the question that has not been questioned. And that's what you get from those people that give you the scope. There's no scope for examination. Study everything. Have a brief description on each subheading for each essay. So after providing a subheading, have a description where you define or whatever that is related to the subheading. And ensure for each essay, know that so that if any essay comes in, you are able to respond. You are able to answer questions. Discuss the relevant content to each subheading. Ensure that the content you provide for each subheading is relevant and correct. Do not take the content for a particular subheading and bring to the other subheading. It will be irrelevant. You will get it wrong. Ensure that the content provided under each subheading is relevant and correct and relating to that particular subheading. Do not list points in a general part, but write in full sentences. Listing is not allowed in there. You can get about two marks. So ensure that you write in full sentences. The, the whole sense of your, your point should be there in that sentence. Then the study strategy. Some of you are struggling with studying. You find the person perusing the book, opening the book. Across, from page one to the last page, then you say you have studied. That is not the study. If you study, you prepare for the study. You plan for the study. You bring the relevant concepts around you. You can't seem to say, I'm studying the business cycle. What in the business cycle? If you study the business cycle, you will have a particular portion of the business cycle that you need to understand. Avoid perusing the whole, the whole chapter uh, if you say you are studying. That is not the study. That is not. The study should be planned for on time. Information should be collected and be brought around so that when you start to study, and then everything is here, you study that small piece. Once you understand it, you go to the next piece. Stop just paging the, the, the textbook across and you say that's a study. That is not a study. Allocate study time according to your performance and your target. You can't be targeting to get 90% in economics and study only for 30 minutes. You need to ensure that you give yourself enough time to study uh, based on your target. Study and assess yourself before using previous question papers. There is this thing of study. Let's say you are studying fiscal policy. You will study fiscal policy and then you will ask yourself some questions or having some questions that are targeted to be answered. After that, you go to the previous question paper that you answer questions on the fiscal policy. It will be easy for you. And ensure that your study is surrounded by self-assessment so that you will test if you have understood the concept or not. And avoid studying and do, doing yourself a favor. When you study, you only assess yourself in the lower order. And ensure that as you assess yourself, it's from lower order middle order and higher order because every topic we deal with every concept we deal with can be questioned in all of these diff different ways lower order middle order and higher order if i can make a simple example in there maybe we talk about leakages mention any two leakages in the open economy you list them briefly describe the concept leakages now that's a definition now it's no longer like the lower order then after that how can leakages affect the economy now, that, that how question now is at the higher level now. You need to think, understand it, think about it. How does it affect you apply now? So it is very important for you, for each concept you are dealing with, to try and assess yourself from lower level, mid level, and high level so that you maximize that topic for the sake of the examination. Use NSC assessment tools uh, to evaluate your study outcomes. Use, I, in this case, we mean use your examination guidelines. Use also your previous question paper, papers and also check memorandums now to see if you did it right or wrong in case the teacher is not around. Let your study expose your content weaknesses. Don't be frustrated, but use your winning methods. The study might frustrate, we know that, when you are trying to start something but it doesn't get through. But you need to be patient with yourself. Keep on pushing until you get there. If ever you have studied something, then you did not, I mean, it did not go through. Uh, it doesn't mean that you will fail, you, you won't get it correct. Ensure that frustration is the last thing that happens to you because once you are frustrated, you stop studying, you do something else. We know when you are frustrated by economics, you will go for a home language. 
you want to go and relax in there. No, focus here. We are writing on Tuesday. You need to ensure that you have the content ready for the question paper. If you are struggling, focus on one main topic between macroeconomics and economic pursuits and study it efficiently. If you discover that I'm not doing well, I have less marks since the beginning of the year, ensure that you focus on like I've said, on that set of topics, if you are doing macro, do macroeconomics and exhaust it all so that you can have opportunities to grab marks. And then you do pursue, you simply do pursue, but not intensively because your strength is on macro. That will allow you to escape level one. We don't need level ones. We don't need level, even level two, actually. So you need to ensure that you score higher. Your teachers have worked very hard to ensure that you guys uh, are ready. So now it's time for you to push yourself. We don't need level ones. Push yourself. So you must have a working strategy. If ever you are frustrated, or maybe the, 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 the question paper is in another way. No question paper can be difficult. Be aware, be, be aware that it can be challenging. You need also to challenge the question paper as much as it is challenging. That's why the preparation must be depth. Each, each topic must be dealt with from lower order, middle order, and higher order. Then you will win in there. And then, but to, to not leave out the second topic because you need uh, it for section A uh, and also half of question four. So you do macro, intensify it, and also do pursuit so that if you want to answer question four, you can be able to answer question four without any challenge. So this is just the warning. We are writing economics paper one on the 1st of November in the morning. And then, we have economic paper two on the 8th of November, 2022, afternoon session. Remember, afternoon session uh, for you, you will be starting writing like literally on the, I mean, uh, at uh, two o'clock. You will be writing by two o'clock up to four because your paper is two hours. But remember, you must arrive on time and you must have an hour before the commencement of the examination. Then this is the issue. Men's and Men's Lead for November, 2022. And then Men's and Men's Lead, Paper 2, 7 November 2022. And then on the 8th of November, there's also something else. The 8th of November 2022, in the morning session, there are some languages that will be written. Now, where does that put you in Paper 2? It means you won't have time to prepare for Paper 2. Now, it is very important for you to ensure that you prepare for Paper 2 intensively on time. Because once uh, you go through maths, you won't have time easily for economics. You will be compromising it, I know, for, for maths and mentally. So it is very important that you integrate economics on your study, paper two, uh, as you go forward. Go, as you reach to maths and mentally, paper one, we have a week where there will be a block, uh, there will be a mentally and maths in there. As much as we will try as educators, as, as educators to be in, but the focus area for you will be on maths and mentally. And then what happens on Tuesday morning, some of you start with home languages. And then after on is economic. So unfairness is there, but you must be strong because that is the way to go. Use the remaining time to prepare for your exams. Ensure that you prepare thoroughly for your examinations. Uh, there will be no miracles. If you don't study, you won't get marks. You won't reach your target. Ensure that your study is intensified. Consult your previous question papers. Have a strategy that is working. Ensure that winning strategy is taken upon so that you will be able to score marks because we are all about marks. Never undermine any mark. Every mark is important. Also, uh, don't be like in this manner. Paper, you see two marks question, maybe for 2.1.1, then you get to be happy you chose the question. Choose the question according to marks that you are believe or you are sure you, you, you will achieve. That's when you do a pre-calculation of marks looking at questions for each question before you, you make a choice. Because if you follow uh, that ice-breaking question, list any two, that will mean now you will go down and stack. Consider last two eight marks questions for 2.4, 3.4, 4.4, 2.5, 3.5, Consider intensifying also in them as you check if you can choose the question. That will give you a credit. So, example of questions. This is more like a revision. Now, the first portion was more like a training and giving you guidelines on how to go about in the question paper. 
This is the lower order. Uh, we say mention any two participants in the economy. So let's see in the closed economy, uh, households or consumers, businesses or firms, government or state. Then if you say foreign sector, you are wrong because now this is a closed economy, not the open economy. Now, if you can check this, we have mentioned. Now, we can develop this to the middle order. Briefly discuss the role of household in the economy. That's a middle order. And then we go higher now. How can a household contribute on building South African economy? You need to think now. How can they contribute on building economy? Now we are at the highest level. I'm trying to make an example of what I was talking about to say. The question, uh, can, I mean, the content can be, can be assessed in the lower order, the same content in the middle order, and the same content in the higher order. So ensure that as you study, you exhaust the round of all of those so that it will be easy for you to get marks. Mention any two markets in the circular flow. Factor market, product market, financial market, as well as the foreign exchange market. We continue with the lower order. Mention any two leakages in the circular flow. That's when we have taxation, savings, and payment for imports. You can turn this around to the middle order. Briefly, describe the concept leakages. Higher order. How can leakages affect or impact the economy? Now you have to think the impact of leakages, all of them here. Mention any two injections in the circular flow. Investment spending, government spending, and payment for exports. We continue avoid listing more because we need only two. Mention two flows in the circular flow. That's when you have money flow as well as real flow. Avoid saying circular flow. It's not working in there now. It's money flow and the real flow. Mention any two examples of real flow in the circular flow. Then you have flow of goods and services. You have the flow of factors of production. We continue with any two methods of calculating GDP. That's when we have income method expansion method as well as the production method. Mention any two examples of indirect tax. Value added tax, add valorem tax, the sin tax, import taxes or import tariffs. We continue the lower order. Mention any, any two instruments of the monetary policy. Repo rate or repurchase rate, cash reserve requirement or reserve requirement ratio, Open market transaction as well as moral suasion or moral persuasion. Mention any two spheres of the government. Local government, provincial government, as well as national government. Then we can turn this around. What is the role of local government? Then we can turn this around to the higher order. How effective have been local government in South Africa on providing public services? You, you know that from lower, middle, higher. So ensure that to play around, ensure that you deal with this service so that it will be easy for you to answer questions in there. We continue with the lower order. Mention any two effects of the public sector failure. We have social instability, economic instability, as well as political instability. List any two sub accounts of the balance of payments. Current account capital transfer account, as well as financial account. Knowing these from the lower order, you must also be able to know them to the higher order level and the middle order. And then that's a middle order question. How does increase in taxes affect the economy? How does the increase in taxes affect the economy? These are our three main concepts that you have to deal with in here. The increase in tax as an action verb, and then Increase in taxes affect the economy. You need to link now that if the tax is increasing, how will the economy react? How will the economy be affected? Increase in taxes is detrimental to the economy. It decreases the level of spending and results to low production and economic growth. If ever tax has been increased, that will lead to, if ever it's an indirect tax like VAT, there will be less affordability of goods and services because increase in VAT increases the selling price. If it's a pay-as-you-earn or income tax, 
that will lead to what? If ever tax have been increased income tax, that will lead to people having less disposable income as a result. There will be lower spending on goods and services, and the economy will be affected negatively. Increased taxes can increase state revenues, which can be used to finance the national budget to improve economic activities. So as taxes are increasing, that can benefit the government because tax revenues by the state will be increasing. High corporate tax increases cost of doing the business and discourage investors into the country's economy. So if ever there's more company tax or corporate tax, that can lead to what? That can simply lead to uh, investors being pessimistic on investing in the country's economy because there is too much government intervention. We continue. What impact does the high savings have on the size of the multiplier? We know that if ever there are more savings, there will be less spending in the economy, so the multiplier will be affected negatively. High level of savings withdraw money from circulation. It decreases the, the level of spending and the result to low size of the multiplier. Why are assets subtracted in the balance of payments? Remember, in there we have, sub, uh, we have assets and liabilities. So why do we subtract assets, not add them? Because we know that assets are always adding more. So let's see. Assets are subtracted in the balance of payments account because they are the outflow of money from the domestic economy. Remember that uh, the money that is flowing into the country is recorded positively and uh, be named as liabilities because the future gains of that amount of money will be, will be enjoyed back in the country of origin. And then assets. We subtract this amount that is flowing out and call it asset because what happens in there? Uh, it's an asset because the future benefit of this investment will be benefiting South Africa as a country. So it will be enjoyed in South Africa. That's why we call it an asset because asset accumulates. We continue. Why is the net gold uh, written separate uh, in the current account? The net gold exports. So it is written separate in the current account, not as a merchandise export. Remember, the trade balance consists of physical goods, physical imports and exports. So we have merchandise exports, net gold exports, and merchandise imports. We don't add net gold together with the merchandise export. Why is that that is the case? Because of its historical importance. So it is written separate from merchandise export because of its historical importance. The gold was used to, to, to determine the value of the currency for each country. So the country with more gold used to have a strong currency. So that's why we regard this the gold. I mean, we rec the gold is recorded separately, not as a part of merchandise exports. How does an overvalued currency impact on the trade balance? Remember, if the currency is overvalued, it is too strong. So that will that, that means our exports will be too expensive abroad. And in the long run, uh, in the short run, we can we can come across more terms of trade, but in the long run, there will be less. So if the currency is overvalued, our export become expensive, which lead to foreign consumers not demanding our goods because they are more expensive, but they seek for alternative products or substitutes. So that will affect our current account negatively. Let's see. An overvalued currency result to trade deficit because it makes export appear more expensive, which decreases the demand, I mean, the foreign demand. If they become more expensive, they won't be that much demanded abroad. Uh, that's why it affects the current account in the negative way. We continue. How can the appreciated action rate affect terms of trade? If the action rate have appreciated, meaning is strong, how can that affect terms of trade? The appreciated uh, action rate, I mean, rate increases the terms of trade. In the short run, remember, in the short run, because it makes exports expensive, which increased export earnings. So in the short run, as our currency becomes strong, uh, our terms of trade will be increasing. But in future or in the long run, they won't be increasing because consumers will be seeking for will seek for alternative product or substitute so they won't be demanding most of our exports so there will be there will be decrease in foreign i mean uh, there will be decrease uh, by foreign consumers they, it will decrease uh, there will be no much demand for our local exported goods and services so the foreign demand will decline on our local produced goods and services that are exported abroad so because of that in the long run we, we will be having it negatively because terms of trade will decline due to the fact that consumers will be seeking for substitute goods that can be used to replace our exported goods and services abroad so the decline in foreign demand will always lead to the decline in terms of trade why is it necessary for the country to analyze balance of payments why should the country analyze its BOP? It is very important for each nation to, to analyze its balance of payment because of it helps the country to discover differences between inflows and outflows. The country can be aware of 
its inflows and outflows. And then also, uh, it, it is helpful to measure a, a country's international competitiveness. So it is very important to calculate BOP figures and analyze them so that we can discover if our country is competitiveness abroad or is not competitiveness. And then also analyzing the balance of payment enables a country to use necessary measures such as borrowings if uh, the country is facing what we call a deficit. So knowing figures of BOP and analyzing them uh, is very much helpful because the country can be able to seek for support such as uh, loans from IMF or loans from uh, other world countries so that they can correct BOP disequilibrium. So it is very important for them uh, to be able to, I mean, to analyze the balance of payment figures. We continue. What in fact does the increase in demand for currency for a currency have on its value? If ever the currency is too demanded, how does that affect its value? Remember, we used to talk about the excess demand and excess supply. The increase in demand for a currency more than the supply is regarded as an excess demand. It leads to the currency depreciating or losing its value. If ever the currency of the country is more demanded by foreign people, that, lead, that, that means that uh, that particular currency will be losing its value. It will depreciate. How can interest rates be used to strengthen under, I mean, an undervalued currency? How can Reserve Bank use interest rate to strengthen or to, uh, to strengthen undervalued currency? The Reserve Bank can decrease interest rates, uh, decrease the demand for domestic currency. Uh, foreign direct investors will be discouraged from investing in uh, if less returns are obtainable. So if ever the Reserve Bank decreased the exchange rate, that will mean uh, foreign investors that are most investing on shares or paper assets will be discouraged because there will be less returns achievable in South Africa if they invest in the country. So that can lead to less demand for our currency abroad. And then data response, exemplars, and eight marks questions. Start the graph and answer questions that follow. We are giving the stats here in a form of graph. These are the interest rates. Uh, you can see 2014 down there, the 2016 is there, then that is 2017 at its highest, and then 2018, and then we have uh, 2020, 2019 is there, and then 2022, slightly at 4%. Which institution is responsible for repo rate in South Africa? Identify a year at which repo rate was at its highest. There will be 2017 here. And then a briefly describe the concept of nominal interest rate. How does the sunspot theory concur with uh, changes in, in, in interest rates? How can the South African Reserve Bank use repo rate to stimulate the underperforming economy? Let's look at questions and answers now. The institution here is South African Reserve Bank or SARP. Identify the year. The year was 2017 where interest rates were very high. Briefly describe the concept nominal interest rate. Nominal interest rate is the interest rate uh, that has not been adjusted for inflation. It has not been adjusted. It remains high or inflated. It is not deflated. We we'll continue. How does the transport theory concur with changes in the interest rate? Changes in interest rate has a huge impact on money supply. Lowered interest rate increase the money supply and, and aggregate demand which might result in inflation if the market has supply constraints. How can South African Reserve Bank use repo rate to stimulate the underperforming economy? We assume that economy is down there at a trap or depression. Central bank can decrease repo rate to increase money supply. With more money supply, with more money, people are always tempted to spend. Therefore, borrowings will increase to finance spending and result to high aggregate demand. The increase in demand increases production, real GDP, as well as economic growth. So if ever an uh, economy is underperforming, Reserve Bank intervened by decreasing interest rates so that there will be more credit creation and more money supply in the economy. With more money supply, there will always be more demand for goods and services because as people hold on money, they're always tempted to spend on goods and services. That will act as a greater incentive to businesses to produce more goods and services, which will increase GDP of the country as well as economic growth of the country. Higher order. How can the, the Department of Finance fiscal policy to stimulate the underperforming economy? Fiscal policy as a whole. Now, remember, fiscal policy talks to this instrument, taxation, government spending, and state debts or borrowings. 
increasing government spending. Uh, increasing government spending has a stimulus effect on the economic variables. The government increased its spending on infrastructure, I mean infrastructure investment, social transfers, services, as well as increasing the spending on wages and salaries for public servants. That's how the government uh, used its spending. And then the increase in government spending stimulates aggregate demand, production, and real GDP, as well as economic growth. Taxation decrease. Uh, lower taxes are a great incentive in the economy. If taxes are very low or are reasonable, that becomes a great incentive in the economy. The decrease in indirect tax decreases selling price or prices and increases uh, real income. Decreases in direct taxes such as personal income tax increases the disposable income for households and increases spending. Decreasing corporate tax or company tax creates an opportunity for businesses to expand their investment, which creates more employment opportunities and the level of spending in the economy. That is how the government can use the fiscal policy. The data response. Here you are given the business cycle here, indicating real GDP of the country. Analyzing, this is very important because now we are noting in 2009, uh, we had negative growth of uh, negative 1,5 percent in the economy. So let's see our questions. The very much not notable part is that economy have decreased to be below even zero going down there. And that year is only 2009. Identify a year with the lowest real uh, gross domestic product. That is 2009. What type of, of trend, I mean, of trend line is used on the above economic model? That is downward trend line. Remember, our trend lines can be separated into three. We have the downward trend, we have the upward trend, and the constant trend. If ever it's done, I mean, it's downward, it indicates that economic variables will be, in, will be decreasing even in the, in the long term. If it's upward, it indicates that economic variables or economic activities will be increasing uh, in future. If it's constant, it indicates that economic variables will not be changing, will remain constant for the given period of time. Briefly describe the concept real gross domestic product. Real GDP refers to figures of GDP that have been adjusted for inflation. Inflation effect has been removed. That is known as a deflated, so as a GDP deflator. How can open market transactions be used to fine tune the above economic slump? We, we have seen that economy is down there, it's below even zero. How can we, we use open market transactions to fine tune that economic slump? The central bank can buy bonds from commercial banks, that is known as quantitative easing, remember? Uh, to increase money supply within the system in order to increase aggregate demand. So remember that if consumers are demanding more goods and services, that, uh, that acts as a great motive for whom? For producers to produce more goods and services, which lead to more employment opportunities within the, uh, businesses and also more production and more GDP. Why is the long downward amplitude not preferred than uh, I mean not, not preferred by economists? If it's long downward, like the one that we have seen, it is not preferred by economists. Long downward amplitude are not preferred in the economy because they indicate the poor economic performance. If the amplitude is downward very much long, going to uh, what you call a horizontal line and go even beyond that, that simply means the economy is drastically declining. So it is not preferred in the economy because it indicates the poor economic performance. The further decline in economic variables result to negative growth of the economy. We've seen in that graph uh, that the economy declined up to zero, then went beyond zero, which means it uh, went below zero, which means now that long downward amplitude went further to the point that there was no production, but everything was negative in the, in the economy. Briefly discuss moving averages. Remember that moving average should be discussed, should be discussed, should be calculated, and also you must be able to plot the graph using moving averages after calculation. A moving average is a tool used to analyze changes that occur in the in a series of data over a period of time. It is calculated to iron out minor fluctuations that re, uh, and reveal trends in the business cycles. The data given can be used to calculate moving averages for the business, I mean for the business cycle for the past three years. Moving averaging 
uh, is, is an analytical tool used to focus the trend of economic performance. So it's a tool that is used uh, to analyze changes in that occur in data series. And then uh, it iron out minor fluctuations. It can be calculated over a period of three years. One can use five years or seven years. Moving averages is known as, as also an analytical tool uh, used to focus the trends of economic performance, how the economy has performed. Then we can be able to make predictions of the future. It is a statistical data or data series used by economies, businesses, and government authorities to predict the future economic performance. Getting that information, it will be easy for business people or economists to extrapolate by using known facts to discover unknown information. We continue with moving averages. By using moving averages uh, determined from a given data, economists get a clear picture of the general trends of business, business cycle. So, uh, economists will get a clear picture of what will happen in future and what has happened in the past based on the economy or the business cycle. To calculate moving averages, qualitative method and quantitative methods are used. We have two methods for moving averages, qualitative and quantitative. So the, quali the quantitative method is based on mathematics, while qualitative method yields research assumptions and probabilities. Qualitative method is also known as judgmental method. So the best method to use based on a uh, business cycling uh, is quantitative because it is based on calculations. We discover those trends and then we can make some assumptions. Other than using qualitative because qualitative is based on mainly judgments. If information is not made available in terms of numbers, we use qualitative because we don't have enough information uh, to calculate and evaluate. But with enough information based on numbers, we can simply go mathematically and calculate moving averages. So this one becomes uh, the quantitative, qualitative becomes judgmental because people use their probabilities uh, to decide what might happen, for which is not accurate because there is no fact in there. A qualitative method is appropriate to use when previous data is not available. So one will use qualitative method if ever the previous information or data is not made available when the long-term focusing is done. So one will always use this method if ever the information is not available or the data in terms of numbers is not made available. They will use their own judgment and probabilities. By calculating moving average, economies or businesses will be able to analyze economic trends over a period of time. So calculating moving averages allow uh, economic people to do what? To be able to analyze and predict even the future and the past of the economic performance. Informed pred predictions are made when the data series has been used uh, properly. If information is available and is used accordingly, there will be proper predictions in there. We will continue briefly discuss terms of trade. Uh, remember, terms of trade uh, is the uh, refers to ratio or index between imports and exports. So the ratio between export prices and import prices is regarded as terms of trade in definition. And then the change in both imports uh, prices and export prices affect terms of trade. Terms of trade are used to focus the foreign trade and country's international competitiveness. So we, we, we use terms of trade to, to focus or check if the country is competitive, is very much competitive or not abroad, and also to focus the foreign trade for the country. As terms of trade change, they affect export earnings, either negative or positive. The improvement in terms of trade is caused by the increase in export prices or the decrease in import prices. So these are two components that will affect terms of trade. Increase in export prices and decrease in import prices will lead to the improvement of terms of trade. In the long run, I mean, in the long run, High export prices may result in the decrease in, in sales volume depending on the price elasticity of the product and therefore result to less income being generated by exports. So if ever our price have increased on exports, that will mean in the long run, uh, consumers will seek for an uh, alternating product that might be used in place of our local product that have been, we have exported. And in that result, there will be less demand for our exports abroad and consumers will be buying the alternating product and that will lead to our terms of trade decline. So this, uh, this table is showing you how to calculate terms of trade. 
We have year one, year two, year three, and year four. And then uh, the formula is uh, in terms of trade equality index of export prices to the index of, I mean, divided by the index of import price multiplied by 100. So, index of exports, we have 102, 94, 92, 105. So, this indicates the decline, this indicates the decline, and there will be an increase. Index of imports, uh, 98, 100, 99. So, this means an increase, and this means a decline, and this means the increase again. So, calculating terms of trade, we have the first one, year number one, there it is. It's 102, this is the one, divided by 98, multiplied by 100, we get 104. That is 104. And then year number two, which is this one, we said 94 divided by 100 times 100. So they decline now, like I've said. So 94 divided by 100 times 100 is 94. So they are declining from 104 to 94. We go further to year number three. We say 92 divided by 99 multiplied by 100. Then we get what? 93. So it is declining also. And then year number four, we say 105 divided by 103 times 100. So 105 divided by 103 times 100 equals to 102. So they have started to increase because the index of export prices have increased to 105 from 92. This have led to what has led to the increase in our terms of trade. So you must be able to explain terms of trade briefly and also be able to calculate terms of trade. Appreciation of the currency. So appreciation graph, change in supply. So there's no assessment in this one. It's just to remind you how do we come across appreciation of the currency. So we say the market is for rent versus dollars. And then this is the quantity. And then this is the price. This was over 10. So this is rent versus dollars. So in this case, uh, we have original supply, original demand. And then there's the equilibrium where they meet. And then our rent was uh, about 15 rand. Uh, equals to one dollar back then so because of the increase in supply of our of our rents in the foreign exchange market the supply increased from s to s1 as it increased from s to s1 the demand remains uh, lower there remains constant doesn't change at one so what happens uh, with the supply of rent increasing more than the demand we come across what we call an excess supply so that means our rent is appreciating because now uh, we will be affording one us dollar with 12 rand than before when we were affording the dollar with how much with 15 rents so our rent became strong it appreciated remember appreciation is the increase in the value of the current in relation to another country's currency due to market forces the same graph comes in and then this is the quantity and this is uh, the price or rent versus dollars. So at the original point, S is the supply, D is original demand curve, E is original equilibrium. There you go. And then uh, one is the qu original quantity demanded and supplied as for the equilibrium. The rent, the supply of rent increases uh, from S to S1. You can see it goes straight to S1, uh, while the demand remains unchanged at D. Quantity of rent supplied increased to four while the value of rent appreciates from 15 to 12, meaning now we can afford more of US dollars with less amount than before when we're paying more. Excess supply of rent occurs. So the rent is oversupplied in the market than when it's demanded. And then now we talk about the appreciation when there's a change in demand. That one was indicating the change in supply. So this one indicates the change in demand. So the demand curve will be changing now. Let's see original points, SS, DD, and then we have our equilibrium point up there where they meet quantity is one so let's simply say this one uh, is q this one will be q1 so what happens the demand for the rent declines from d to d1 it, go, it goes down there and the demand for the rent declines so the rent is no longer under pressure in the foreign exchange market so we go down to d1 which will lead to our currency appreciating because before we used to pay to afford one US dollar uh, with how much? With 15 rand, but now we're paying 12 rand. So that means our currency have gained the strength. So it is strong enough now. So in this case, we can see the quantity decreasing from Q to Q1 in there. That means we can afford uh, the dollar with less amount of rent than before when we we're paying a lot of money. So this is still the excess supply because the, the supply remains higher, but the demand is declining. 
So that lead to what we call the appreciation of the currency while there's a change in demand. So the same graph comes in. That is the explanation. Remember, this is rand versus dollar, and then this is the quantity. All right, at original point, S is supply curve, D is the demand curve, E is original equilibrium, 15 is the original bill of the rent. One is the original quantity demanded and supplied. There you go. And then remember, we said this is Q, this is Q1. And then let's see, the demand for rent decreased from D1, I mean, decreased from D to D1. There you go, you see D1 in there, while the supply remains unchanged. Quantity of rent demanded decrease, Decrease to 1, while the, the value of rent appreciates from 15 to 12. That's what we have seen. It appreciates from 15 to 12. It gets stronger because now, to afford a single dollar, we need to pay 12 rand than before when we're paying 15 rand. So that is known as appreciation. Excess supply for the rent. Okay. And then let's look at the depreciation. Remember, depreciation is the decrease in the value of the country's currency in relation to, to another country's currency because of market forces. So let's look at this one. So this was over 10 also. This is quantity. And this becomes rent versus dollars. So what happens here? For us to come across depreciation, there must be excess demand. If there is excess demand, that means the demand for the rent is more than the supply of the rent. So that means uh, there will be a depreciation of the currency. Let's look. Original point, original point. Supply, demand. They meet here at the equilibrium. And then the quantity is how much? Is one. And then the price uh, is 12, meaning we are affording $1 with 12 francs. So we assume this is Q, this is Q1. And then the demand for South African rents increases in the foreign market, increases to D1. If it increases to D1, supply remains unchanged. That simply means that now there will be excess demand because the demand is more than the supply of rents. And that will lead to our currency becoming weak or losing the strength or depreciating due to the fact that it is over demanded in the global market while we cannot supply most of our currency. So that's why now we will be affording a single dollar by 15 rents than before we were affording it by 12 rents. So it has lost its value. It cannot afford the most of the foreign currency. That's what we call a depreciation caused by what we call the excess demand of the currency. So the graph comes in, so we we'll take this one, we have uh, the quantity, and then that is the rent versus dollar, and then we have Q and Q1. The excess demand prevails again. There you see original points as, like we're repeating ourselves, what happens in there? Uh, the demand for rent increased from D to D1, while the supply remains unchanged. The quantity of rent uh, demanded increases to 4, uh, uh, while the value of rent uh, depreciates from 12 to 15, this is the main concern. This means, this means uh, depreciation because now uh, we use indirect approach. Uh, as we have to pay 15 rand to afford a single dollar, that means the dollar is becoming expensive and our rand is then depreciated. Excess demand occurs in there. And then it changes in supply. That's when now the supply is declining, but the demand remains high. So let's look at this one. Original point supply, original demand curve. The immediate equilibrium, the amount is 12. So this is the quantity, and then that becomes a uh, rent versus dollar. So what happens? Uh, at the original point, that is the equilibrium, and the quantity supplied is 4. We say this is Q, this will be Q1. So what has happened? The supply curve shifted back. It declined the supply for the rent. So we are no longer supplying most of our rent. As the supply for the rent declined, the quantity supplied goes to Q1. It declines to Q1, and then the demand remains unchanged. It remains at, at Q, which means it's higher. Because of that, there is still an excess demand because the demand remains more than the supply within this curve. So the demand is more than the supply. The supply is up there, and the demand is back there. So it means the demand is more than the supply because the demand is for numbers is 4. The supply is 1. So that's an excess demand, which leads to the depreciation of the currency. The currency have lost its value. And then there is the same graph coming in. So our concern is here, a quantity of rent supply decreased to 1, while the value of rent depreciates from 12 to 15. Remember, this is the quantity, and this is the rent versus dollars. So excess demand for rent uh, prevailed in there, resulting to the depreciation of the currency. This is just to give you a highlight. In case you come across the graph in the examination, that is all about the change in demand or supply for the currencies. Look at it and see if ever uh, there is an excess demand or excess supply. Is there any increase in supply? 
there will be appreciation. Is there any increase in demand that will lead to the depreciation? If the supply decreases, that will simply mean that there is a depreciation because the demand becomes more than the supply in that case. But if the demand decreases, that will mean the appreciation because the demand will be low while the supply remains high. And then this is the question based on the foreign exchange market. You are given a price of US dollars versus rent, quantity in millions. So original point is here. We have the supply and the demand. That is equilibrium at 12 units or quantity. The, the value of rent is 8 rand against the dollar. We pay 8 rand to accord $1. And then the supply declines from S to S1. As the supply declines from S to S1, the quantity supplied goes to 10. And the, the value of rent uh, depreciates. Uh, it goes straight to 9. We need to pay 9 rand to afford a single dollar now. In this case, let's go straight and, and see uh, our, what you call our tag. What is the equilibrium quantity? Uh, the equilibrium quantity in there, uh, what is it? It is equal, equals to 8 rand is to 1 US dollar. And then what is the result of, an, in, of the decrease in the supply of dollars uh, on the value of rent? If ever the supply of dollars uh, is decreasing. The value of rent is depreciated. Depreciated uh, uh, to 1 rand is to, uh, I, mean, I mean, 9 rand is to 1 US dollar. Decreased, dropped, or weakened. Briefly describe the term appreciation. Appreciation is an increase in the value of the currency in relation to another country's currency. Accept any other correct relevant answer. What will the, will, will the impact be uh, of an overvalued currency on the balance of payment? It can lead to the continuous deficit on the current account of the balance of payment. And then why do some countries prefer fixed exchange rate system? Uh, it tends to avoid uh, uncertainties with regard to exchange rate. It prevents them from running out of the foreign currency. That was for 10 marks. Then the free trade assessment. Uh, how can free trade affect emerging economies? So it is very important that you understand what is meant by free trade. You normally ignore it because there's no essay on free trade. Free trade occurs when there's a, a, I mean, when countries can trade with one another for free without any trade barriers or restrictions imposed in there. So there will be a simple movement of goods and services from one country to another without some taxes, without some quotas or limits being imposed and some other restrictions being imposed. That is known as a free trade. So how can free trade policy affect emerging economies, those economies that are potentially developing and they are approaching to the stage of being developed? Free trade policy opens an opportunity for infant businesses to expand without limitations in the foreign markets. So it gives them opportunity to expand and grow. Free trade promotes efficiency, use of economic resources to infant industries as they produce for local and foreign markets. With the free trade, there will be more production of goods and services because now the, each business will be producing to, to serve the local market and the foreign market. High competitiveness caused by free trade improves the level of creativeness and innovation. If ever there is more competition because of the free trade, business will be more innovative and they will be creative as infant industries compete in a wider scope. So infant industries will be able to be very much competitiveness and they will be innovative. In that case, uh, that is caused by the fact that they are competing in the wider scope. They are not only committing local, but, but they are committing local and abroad. Free trade policies can result to businesses from developing countries, uh, I mean, uh, accessing capital easily to support their production. So with the free trade, the movement of capital will not be restricted. There will be no much tariffs imposed on the movement of capital. Therefore, they will easily access capital, uh, which will lead to them being very much productive. And then we continue. How can free trade policy affect emerging economies? Negative. Developing countries are, de uh, are dominated by infant industries. Uh, which has less productive capacity. They lack uh, the capital to produce for both local and foreign markets. Industries from emerging economies have less to offer in the inter international market as compared to the industrialized economies. So they will, they will always be disadvantaged because they will be committing unfairly with those, uh, the, those business of the multinational, uh, or those industries of develop, developed countries that are regarded to be multinational industries or strategic industries. Free trade policy, have an effect of cutting down the local market because competition can be too can be too high for local uh, industries since foreign competitors might be having advantage of economic of scale. So some of them are having subsidies from their governments. Some of them are facing economies of scale. So as they sell their goods locally, they will be selling their goods at a very much lower cost, which will force out our local businesses. 
the problem of dumping will arise. So there will be dumping occurring because they will get an opportunity from abroad to sell their goods in South Africa that uh, at the lowest possible cost than in their countries of origin. We we'll continue. How can free trade contribute to more efficient economy? If ever there's a free trade, we know that there will always be economic efficiency because the production will always be high and there will be high level of creativeness and innovation. Innovative. It can contribute by allowing the inflow and outflow of goods and services into the economy, stimulating demand for goods and services, hence creating job opportunities locally, improving the trade balance by making it more favorable. If our local firms will be very much motivated to export their goods, there will be more export going out. So that can make, simply make our BOP being favorable. Ending uh, the foreign, I mean, I mean, ending the, uh, the, the, the country foreign capital and accelerating economic growth and economic development. So with the free trade, we'll be able to export more goods and then we'll be ending the foreign currency, which will lead to, also will be able to get the capital for the country, which will lead to economic growth and economic development because now there will be income flowing into the country's economy. Improving international relations and stimulating economic integration. With the free trade, there will be good relations between countries, so it will allow us as a country to benefit easily. And then there will also be a developed economic integration between wealthy countries because of the free trade. Improving international competitiveness and expansion of industries. Local industries can get an opportunity to expand in the global market because of the free trade. And they can be very much competitive in the global market because of the free trade. It can allow them to grow if they are willing to grow. Why is the protectionism policy not good for developing countries? Remember protectionism. It occurs when the government uses measures to protect local industries against the foreign companies. The protectionism is not good for developing countries because retaliation by imposing more tariffs, their imports might have negative impact and that can decrease their net export earnings. If Foreign countries can do the same, can retaliate by imposing a more tariffs on our exported goods and services that which can be much negative because we are still exporting. Materials can therefore result in sidelined uh, by most of well powerful countries. If we protect our own businesses and the economy, that can lead to foreign countries not willing to share with us their capital goods and materials. This can result to even further scarcity of capital. If ever there is a retaliation, we can lack capital that is necessary for us to process our minerals or natural resources as a country. Modern markets are too technical. Protectionism might result to developing countries not getting advantage uh, to access the latest technological trends to expand uh, the local markets. If we are being sidelined as a country, it will be difficult for us to access the later technical trends that are very much important for us to improve our production and our economy. And then the import substitution. Evaluate South Africa's import substitution policy. Let's see. In, uh, increase in industrial growth and development as new industries will be established. Remember that uh, the import substitution occurs when the, the government use some restrictive policies such as import tariffs, uh, import quotas, and other restrictive measures to prevent the end of imported goods in South Africa. So if ever there's import uh, substitution, our local industry can get a chance to grow, and some of them can be established. Increase the profits leading to further investments. As our local firms are enjoying profits, there will be more investments locally by local businesses. Tariffs introduced in South, Af uh, in South Africa can lead to increased demand for local manufactured goods and services. Remember, if ever they impose tariffs on imported goods and services, our local goods might appear a relatively cheap, then local consumers will neglect imported goods and demand local goods because they are affordable and cheap. Import substitution improves industrialization, which increases employment opportunities. With the import substitution, there will be more industries being established because they are motivated by the production from the government. That will lead to more job opportunities being created because of more industries are being established. A decrease in the import has an positive impact on balance of payments as more export then imports will take place. So if ever we prevent the end of imports while we, are, we keep on exporting, that will be good for our economy. However, we must know that retaliation always occurs and not all goods can be substituted. Not all imports can be substituted because remember, we're a developing country. So in that case, we are lacking some capital goods and technical goods that are necessary for us to process our, uh, good, our natural resources. So in that case, implementing a one much aggressive 
uh, because we know that we are mainly dependent on other countries in order to, fin to finalize or to process our resources to final goods. We will be avoiding that because of retaliation. We continue. Import of is, is restrictive as the choice of goods and services available for consumers may be limited. So, uh, in this case, if ever they, imp they impose uh, the policy of import substitution, that can lead to consumers' uh, welfare being compromised because they will be having less uh, choices because it will not now be available. As they will be available, they will be expensive. So, it does not give them much choice. So, it undermines their standards of living. It is not easy to implement policy of import substitution due to uh, unrecorded informal or illegal transactions. Some transactions okay. And remember, with the import substitution, some of goods will be flowing into the country illegally. So, which will lead to really no tariffs received by the government and our, our economy will be undermined by those illegal goods that are flowing into the country. It does not necessarily lead to an overall reduction of imports. South Africa has uh, to import capital and intended goods uh, to manufacture consumer goods. So, uh, if import substitution does not mean that we are simply blocking all goods, we'll be blocking those goods that we can be able to produce locally as a country. So it does not mean the complete ban of or the complete ban of the block of imports, but it means uh, some of the goods will be sidelined because we can produce them on our own. But the one that we cannot produce on our own cannot be substituted because we depend mostly on foreign countries to provide those goods or the capital to manufacture those goods and services. Inefficient local production may occur because local producers are shielded from international competition. So, since we are not facing that competition, uh, which is global, uh, we might face inefficiency in the production because the production by the government give us uh, the advantage over in the short run. However, we cannot easily grow as local businesses due to the fact that we are not uh, learning anything since uh, globally uh, we are not very much effective due to the fact that government is protecting us as local businesses. The export promotion. And then we are given the extract here. The directorate uh, is mandated to promote South African value-added goods and services abroad by broadening the export base, increasing market share in targeting high growth market and sustaining market share in, in the, uh, I mean, international market. This objective is pursued through the review of, I mean, and finalization of national export strategy, which is administered by the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition. These are the questions. Identify the industry uh, that promote the above policy in South Africa. Mention one objective of the export promotion. Briefly describe the concept of export promotion. How can export promotion affect subsidized businesses if the government withdraw its support? What is the impact of export promotion to the balance of payments? Then the source is DTIC, Department of Trade and Communication. I mean, I mean and competition. And then identify the department. It's a Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Mention one objective of export promotion to promote South Africa value-added goods and services, increasing the market share in targeted high growth area and sustaining market share in traditional markets. Briefly discuss or describe the concept of export promotion. The export promotion is the use of subsidy and, and incentive to support, I mean, in support of local exporting businesses to be competitive in the foreign markets. And then continuity. How can export promotion affect subsidized businesses if the government withdraw its support? This is very important. Uh, export promotion creates uh, more rel I mean, reliance on the government. The withdrawal of subsidies and, and incentive or support can result to affected local businesses failing to compete internationally. If ever the state can intervene, but I mean, can simply withdraw its support on those businesses that were former supported through export promotion. Those businesses cannot afford to stand the foreign competition or the open competition because they are no longer shielded or supported by the government. And then uh, let's continue. What is the impact of export promotion to the balance of payments? Uh, export promotion increases the outflow of both the visible and invisible um, exports, which result to more inflow of the currency. The increase in export decreases the current account uh, deficit and the balance of, balance of payment account deficit. So it affects it positively because there will be positive trade balance. There will be a, sub, a trade surplus because exports will be exceeding imports due to the fact that the government have intervened by promoting export through the effect of subsidies as well as incentive and all other measures to promote exports. This is the public sector example, ISA, or I mean, example of ISA. 
uh, public sector objectives. Discuss in detail public sector objectives. 20, 26 marks. And then how successful has the government, has the South African government been on achieving its objectives? And then remember there must be introduction. This is just the sample. Public sector objectives are target set, I mean global set uh, as a benchmark to be achieved in order to, uh, to ensure social stability and economic welfare. Achieving this objective successfully declared the country as one of most developing or developed countries. You can even uh, define the public sector with its spheres. Economic growth, remember economic growth is a sub aging weather mark. Uh, remember economic growth is the increase in productive capacity of the country. That is the main concept in the, we continue. It is reflected uh, in an increase in real GDP or measured by real GDP. So the increase in real GDP will always increase economic growth. Real GDP is the, uh, is the value of goods produced in the country after the effect of inflation has been removed. Uh, an increase in real GDP means that the country will have an ability or the ability to supply its people with goods and services. Economic growth continues. To achieve economic growth, economic growth rate must increase more than population growth rate in the country. Economic growth is measured through I mean, as an annual percentage of increase in GDP at constant prices. This will mean that there will be less people that are dependent on the state to satisfy their basic needs because people will be employed. This will make it possible to improve the standard of living of people in the country and reduce poverty. Economic growth continues. The government promotes investment in small businesses, micro and medium enterprises to promote economic growth. Export promotion policy is used to promote local production into the global market. Industrial development policies are used to promote industrial based production. Policies such as Triple PE, the broad based black economic empowerment, new growth path, and GIA growth employment and redistribution, including the ASCESA, are used to promote economic growth in the country. Full employment. Uh, it worth one mark because the subheading in there in your essay. Remember, full employment occurs when? Or oh, let's say, let's go according to this. The government's uh, most important priority is to create some decent jobs for the unemployed. They use both macro and microeconomic policies to create an environment that supports more labor in absorption or absorbing activities or labor intensive activities. The state attempts to minimize unemployment by taking action to ensure that all members of the economy, economically active population who would like to work are, and able to work are employed. Low rates of unemployment also uh, correlate with other positive socioeconomic indicators such as lower crime rate and better health standards. We continue with the full employment. Accelerate employment creation through direct employment schemes, targeted subsidies and more expansionary macroeconomic policies. Support labor intensive activities, especially in agriculture and light manufacturing. Provide incentive to encourage private sector investment and I mean in the industries which generate large scale employment. Support knowledge intensive and capital intensive sector, sectors in order to maintain competitiveness. Support informal sector to create employment opportunities. The price stability. Remember, price stability means price that do not increase or decrease over time. So price stability means that the price of consumer goods change by small margins only. Price stability is, I mean, is in the best interest of both businesses and consumers. So we need price stability, especially businesses or investors, they need price stability so that they will, they, they will not face uncertainty. They will be able to guarantee their gains. Also consumers. And then when prices are able, I mean, are stable, firms and households are able to, to anticipate income and expenditure, which enables better planning and accurate budget. Stable prices also improve investor confidence and attract direct, I mean, for, uh, attract direct foreign investments and domestic investors. So it attracts direct foreign investment as well as other domestic investors into the economy. Since year 2000, South Africa has started to use inflation targeting to monitor inflation, which is between 3 to 6%. Inflation targeting is a monetary policy framework where the central bank announces an explicit inflation target and implements policy to keep it within those limits. The South African Reserve Bank decided in order to keep prices stable, the inflation rate should be kept between 3 to 6%. And then the CPI or consumer price index and the PPI producer price index uh, is used to determine the level of prices in the economy. 
If inflation exceeds the upper limit or the highest target, the Southern Reserve Bank must consider increasing interest rate to cool down the overheated economy. If inflation drops below the lower limit or target, Southern Reserve Bank must reduce interest rate to interest rate to stimulate the economy so that there will be more credit creation and more demand for goods and services. The exchange rate stability. We know that exchange rate is the currency of one country in relation to another country's currency. So the extreme fluctuations, depression and appreciation in the action, I mean in the action rate. Uh, create uncertainties. So if ever there is too much appreciation and depreciation, it creates uncertainties in the market and should be limited. Action rates influence the flow of goods, services, and capital in the country from other countries. It has a strong impact on balance of payments, inflation, and other macroeconomic variables. Economic equity. Economic equity refers to the economy that does not have much income gap between rich and the poor. South Africa is one of the world countries that are having high income inequalities in the world. Rich people, capitalism is getting richer while underprivileged people are getting even more poor. Economic inequalities result to too few goods flowing to most of the population, while too many goods are flowing to few people in the economy. The South African government uses progressive tax system as a mechanism to, uh, to redistribution. High income earners are being taxed more, while low income earners are, are being taxed less. The state redistributes re income back to the economy through social security services, social grants like child support grants, disability grants, and old age pensions. Empowerment policies like triple BE and PE, non-cash benefits are also given to people so that the gap can be closed between rich and poor. Additional part, how successful has the South African, South African government been uh, on achieving its objectives? The state has failed to achieve most of its objectives, including economic growth, full employment, action rate, stability, and economic equity. Price stability is one of the macroeconomic objectives that has been achieved in the South Africa over the past years. Inflation targeting has, has led to prices not increasing and decreasing over time. However, in 2020, I mean 2022 has recorded a high inflation rate of 7.4%, which has resulted to the government increasing its interest rates. High unemployment and lower economic growth is a major concern in South African economy. These objectives are far from being achieved by the government. South Africa remains as a country with high economic inequalities in the world, according to World Bank statistics in 2022. South African rent remains volatile in the foreign exchange markets because it appreciates and depreciates and have lost value over the past years. Conclusion. The continuous failure to achieve public sector objective in South Africa has led to severe economic and social unrest uh, as cost of living increased faster than economic opportunities for the population. That is just an example of the conclusion you can make use of. And then this is another sample of the essay from Economic Pursuits. Discussing in detail South Africa's and overs uh, or in regional development. How successful is the government in promoting industrial development in South Africa? 40 marks all in all. So we'll simply be quick on this one. Regional development refer to policies which are aimed at increasing the economic life of specific areas or regions. Any, any other correct relevant response is given a mark. And then special development initiatives. That is the body. SDI is a policy to promote sustainable de industrial development in areas where poverty and, un and unemployment are at its highest. So they are very, very high. That's a special development initiative or SDI. It can be defined as a link between important economic hubs and regions in a country. The intention was to grow SDIs mostly through private sector investment. The state was uh, to enhance inward investment through uh, the granting of incentives. The public, I mean, the public-private partnership promotes the economic potential of under, underdeveloped areas where they form those partnerships. Then we continue. Special development initiative continue. In a public-private partnership or triple P, a private business may provide the capital to build the factory and to buy raw materials and employ labor, while the government provides the capital for infrastructure, e.g., roads and water. Uh, there are two types of triple P's or public-private partnerships which are compensated differently, unitary payments and user fees. The SDI involved interdepartmental investment strategy uh, that the DTI Department of Trade and Industry and the Department of Transport are leading. So it is led by two departments. 
the government industrial policies strive towards bal uh, the balance between openness and promoting local competitiveness by opening up the domestic economy to international competition. So it allows our economy to be very much competitive even into the global market. Department of Transport or GTI, I mean Department of Trade and Industry is driving force behind industrial and spatial development. Relies on networking with other central, uh, I mean other central provincial governments, departments, IDC, parasatals like Telecom, ESCOM, and Transnet, and uh, research institutions to plan and monitor development. Key policy remains sustainable industrial development in areas where poverty and unemployment are at their highest. And then we continue. SDI focus on high level support of areas where eco social economic conditions require concentrated government assistance and inherent economic potential exist. SDI goal uh, is to fast track investment and maximize uh, synergies between various types of investments. Objectives of SDI develop physical infrastructure such as roads and harbors, stimulate economic activities in the underprivileged areas. Create employment and stimulate economic growth in underdeveloped areas. Develop inherent economic potential uh, in the underdeveloped areas. Attract private sector and the foreign direct investment FDIs. Establish public private partnership triple P's. Industrial development zones or ITZs. They are purposely built industrial estate, physical enclosed to or linked to seaports and airports. They are in duty free import areas. This strategy was aimed at making export internationally competitiveness, I mean, very much competitive. They focus on creating jobs and promoting exports in the country. Good produce in these zones should be exported to foreign countries. As services are provided from outside, uh, the economy in the areas should be stimulated. An ITZ offers a world-class infrastructure, enjoys zero rate of VAT on supplies from South Africa, South African sources and reduced taxation on some products. We continue with ITZ. ITZ were located to benefit in investing companies through support, accessing uh, to transport for exporting purposes, products produced for export by wavering import duties, skills training uh, for employees by providing subsidies. We continue the ITZ. Each ITZ is designed to do the following. Provide location for establishment of strategic investments. Promote and develop links between domestic and uh, zone-based industries. Enable exploitation of resource-intensive industries. Special Economic Zones, SEZ. It creates a basis for a broader, a broader range of industrial parks and provide economic infrastructure to promote employment. Geographically demarcated area where specific economic activities are being identified to develop by the government. These areas may enjoy incentives such as tax relief and support system to promote industrial development. We continue the SEZ. There are plans to reduce tax to 15% as an incentive to attract new industries. The aim uh, of creating SEZ is to attract only new businesses. Businesses which are developing a new product line. Business which are expanding their volume. The DTI has indicated that the existing ideas that where special tax incentives do not apply would be graduated into SEZs or will be converted to SEZ. The corridors. Corridors in South Africa are special areas that offer specific advantages to mining, manufacturing, and other businesses. These are this refers to the track of land that form the passageway to allow access from one point to another. The advantage are, advantages also include the presence of existing infrastructure and the specialization of products or service. These corridors are, de are development areas within South Africa and are the development priorities of all uh, development agencies. The Department of Trade and Industry provides help to support the development corridors, e.g. Maputo Corridor, that starts in Gauteng and extend through Bumalanga to the Maputo port, offers opportunity to, uh, to the transport industry. Uh, remember that corridors, there are two types of corridors, corridors within South Africa and corridors beyond South Africa or South African borders. So, a different part. The government has promoted industrial development by 
implementing GEAR, which focuses on promoting growth in the economy, although it hasn't been successful because real GDP growth is not at the expected levels. The new growth part of NGP, which focuses on improving certain skills, which would attract global businesses and ensure long-term economic growth, has not been has not has not seen which are unemployed. National Industrial Policy Framework NIPF as an appropriate policy with the best practice, although hindered by unemployment problem. We continue spending huge amounts on improvement of infrastructure through the SDI, for example, maintaining, maintaining, improving, expanding infrastructure, access to suitable, modern, reliable, effective, efficient infrastructure and services. The creation of jobs was not enough to reduce unemployment. Implementation of ITZ, although some ITZ growth have been slow due to incentive not being attracted, I mean attractive enough to establish businesses. Introducing SEZ to address the negative elements of ITZ by promoting additional incentives. Promoting small businesses development that has been reasonably successful due to the improved access to finance and capital, which has promoted international opportunities as well as efficient and committed markets. Promoting regional development, although it is still uneven because it is still concentrated in major metropolitan. Any other correct and relevant response was given a mark. And then conclusion of the essay, it's just an example. It is the ultimate responsibility for the government to ensure that proper and effective policies and policy direction is given on the entire development of the country. Every area in the country should be considered as for development and growth. The industrial sector is earmarked as safety, I mean a safe net for millions of jobless people in the rural areas. Our essay ends here. A regional part worth two marks. So these were just examples of essays picking from my macro and economic pursuit. Our lesson ends here, and I thank you.